Let's look into this this morning. I was going to go to Psalm 24. I am going to Psalm 24. I actually have that sermon all worked out. And then I was getting the background and working on the background of that, of that psalm. And um, the background kind of just got so big that I uh, made a whole sermon out of the background. And next week, Lord willing, the rapture don't take place before that, um, I'll preach through the text of Psalm um, 24. We, we looked at Psalm 23, a couple of weeks of that. Psalm 22, a couple of weeks of that. And now we're taking a couple of weeks of Psalm 24. Actually, the background of this, well, let's get into that. I say from 1 Samuel chapter 4 through 7, and then we jump to 2 Samuel chapter 6. What? Why those? Well, you'll see as we go along. Okay, first our morning joke. Are you ready for this? All right, you ready? Ready? Here we go. Doctor, I'm sorry, but you suffer from a terminal illness and have only 10 to live. What do you mean, 10? 10 what? Months? Weeks? What? Doctor, 9, 8, 7. <laughs> I like that. All right, let's get into this. All right. The background of Psalm, uh, oh, a couple of quotes. I want to begin with a couple of quotes from the Psalm. By the way, Dan, that song was taken directly right from Psalm 24, that, that very rocky song that you thought was a very rocky song. But that, good song, good song. Uh, here's a couple of quotes. I'm bringing these quotes because these really play into the background here of it, okay? Psalm 24, verse 3 says, Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord, and who can stand before his holy place. Now we're going to look at that in context next week as we work our way through the psalm, but that is kind of important um, as we go through here. A second quote um, from the psalm, verse 7 says, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. That's a quote from Psalm 24. We immediately jump to perhaps the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ, a fulfillment of that. We'll talk about that next week. But this helps us place the psalm uh, where in history it went, okay? It does not have in the title exactly where it was written. But as you read the various commentators, most commentators believe that Psalm 24 was written for a particular occasion that happened, and that occasion is described in 2 Samuel chapter 6. It is when, uh, here's the verse, verse 1, David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. That is when David danced before the Lord with all his might, and his wife, Michael, thought he was, oh, you, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. And, and, uh, um, but that verse that says, Oh, lift up you know, your voice, O oh, gates, and uh, open doors that the king of glory may come in. Most Bible co commentators believe that that was when David came to the gates of Jerusalem with the Ark of the Covenant, to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. That was the setting, of course. Prophecy fulfilled then in the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ entering that gate as well. We'll talk about that next week. So I started getting into this and um, want to go through the whole history of the Ark. Why is it at Obed-Edom's house and David now finally bringing it to Jerusalem? Huh? What is the background there? Well, there's quite an extensive background. So let me take a little time, <coughs> a whole message, a little time, and uh, give you the background uh, of that occasion. Okay, so here we go. Let's go back. The Ark of the Covenant. Don't get it confused with Noah's Ark. That was the great big thing that held all the animals. When they... Um, Exited Egypt in the Exodus, the Lord gave them instructions for building the temporary temple, which we call the tabernacle, and gave them the instructions. God specifically gifted several men for craftsmanship. You remember that back there in the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers as it describes all of that. One of the pieces of furniture that was to go into the tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant. Um, it was the centerpiece of the Ark of the Covenant. There was the outer court, 
And then there was an inner court called the holy place. And then inside that, yeah, there was a big, heavy curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And inside the most holy place set the Ark of the Covenant. The word ark literally means box. That's why when they talk about um, Noah building the ark, it was probably a big square box type of a boat. Um, the ark uh, was a big box. It would set in the Holy of Holies. It had two, it, had, it was a golden box overspread with two golden cherubims. They had their wings outstretched, one on this side, one on that side, and they had their wings outstretched, touching each other in the middle, and they were looking down to the center of that ark. Now, it was a box. It had some things in it. Inside of it was Noah's buddy, Noah's, huh? Moses, yeah, yeah I'm getting my arks mixed up. How many animals did Moses bring on the ark? Wow, well, yeah, you got that joke, huh? Uh, Moses' budding rod was in the Ark of the Covenant. There was a jar of manna. When I read that jar, I always think of a mason jar. They didn't have that and then. It was a pot shared, you know, jar, a pottery jar. And the uh, two tablets of the law. The law which condemned us and pointed out our sin. And then it had a covering. Oh, the covering. The two cherubim were attached to that covering. And right in the middle, where the cherubim were, were looking, was a very, very special place. It was called, translated, oddly, translated the mercy seat. Now, this thing, this ark, sat in the Holy of Holies. Great big thick curtain separating it from the holy place. And once the tabernacle was up and was set up and erected and, and everyone was doing their sacrifices, nobody, nobody went into that holy, most holy place except one person. And that was only one time a year. It was the high priest would bring blood through the big thick curtain and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat on the day of atonement, which was a symbol of, People of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The law was in the, in the Ark of the Covenant condemning mankind and Jesus' blood, symbolic of Jesus' blood, saving us from the condemnation of the law. So that's kind of a background. Interesting, <laughs> interesting stories. The, the Bible tells us that the high priest had little bells, bells and pomegranates pomegranates were little hard balls okay so, um every other one was a bell and a pomegranate bell pomegranate bell pom sewn to the hem of his high priestly garment and that was so that when he walked around in the most holy place they could hear that he was still active we don't find this in scripture that exodus doesn't tell them to do that but tradition the jewish tradition says they actually tied a rope around the high priest's foot, so if those bells stopped dinging in there <laughs> and he had done something wrong and the Lord had struck him dead, who's going to go in and get him? You know, <laughs> I'm not going in there to get him. So they would be able to pull him out with that rope. I don't know that that ever happened. There were people struck dead for irreverence to the Ark of the Covenant. We're going to see that today, but I don't know if a high priest ever dropped dead in the midst of sprinkling blood on the mercy seat. But that's tradition. It says that he had a rope around his ankle. Well, I need to get going here. So that was a overspread with two cherubim. The cherubim were looking down on the mercy seat. You know, the New Testament says the angels look at our salvation and, and, and in wonder and awe of what God did for us. That was symbolic. The two cherubim, um, one of the groups of angels, representations of the cherubim were looking down and seeing the blood sprinkled on the mercy seat. All right. It symbolized the fact that God dwelt in the midst of the Israelites and his glory resided with them. There was a point in the Exodus and then there was a point when Solomon got the temple built 
There was a point when they got the tabernacle all built and all set up, that the, what we call the Shekinah glory. That's the Hebrew word that's used for that kind of glory. The Shekinah glory came and dwelt in the Holy of Holies. God symbolically dwelt in, with the Ark of the Covenant. I was, I didn't do it. I was going to grab a, a YouTube video about um, um, Indiana Jones and the Ark of the Covenant, but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't grab that. So. That glory, seen as a fire by day and a great shining cloud by night, had led them through the wilderness, and then it came into the tabernacle as symbolic that the Lord was with them. After John Joshua's conquest, okay, you hear about this tabernacle. The tabernacle dwelt with them through the 40 years of wandering through the wilderness. It was with them when they conquered Israel. Okay. Now, after Joshua's conquering, the tabernacle finally rested for a long time along with the Ark of the Covenant in the city of Shiloh. They would still go up to Shiloh and sacrifice at the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant there. All right, there's the background. All right, now let's jump into our story. You see on our sheet, I got, I got a whole bunch of stories listed. We find in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 4, the Israelites were battling the Philistines, their enemies. And they says, well, we need the Lord to go with us into battle. So against the Lord's law, they thought if they would bring the Ark of the Covenant into battle with them, that would give them the victory because the Lord would be fighting right there with them. So under Eli and under Eli's two sons, um, they superstitiously thought the Ark would guarantee victory against the Philistines, so they brought the Ark of the Covenant into battle with them. And lo and behold, the Lord was not particularly with them. Um, the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 4 captured the Ark of the Covenant. They thought this was a great prize, you know, they didn't understand it. But this was a religious relic of the Israelites that they had brought into battle with them. And now we Philistines have conquered it. So they they had the Ark of the Covenant, a great trophy from beating the Israelites in that battle. Well, well, just a little bit of background there. Eli's two wicked sons, they died during that battle. And I, I don't know if you know if you remember the story, that word came to Eli that has his two sons had died, and it says Eli was a very large man. <coughs> we don't want to talk about that, but he was a very large guy, and he was sitting on a stool, and when he heard the news of his two sons, he fell backwards and he hit his head, and Eli the high priest, the, or the, 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 the priest died. Samuel then took over. Um, remember, Eli had raised Samuel. So soon after that disastrous day in 1 Samuel chapter 4, it's kind of interesting. Eli's daughter-in-law, one of the wives of the two sons, she was pregnant and about due, and her husband dies in battle. Well, she bore a son, and they named him Ichabod. You have heard that name before. Uh, we have the famous story of Ichabod Crane, you know, but also it, it is a well-known, uh, we have expressions that the Lord writes Ichabod over that church, you know. The name literally means, um, well, the glory has departed. Avod is the Hebrew word for glory, different than the Shekinah glory, avod. And then that prefix, uh, ich, is a negative. So it literally means no glory, or the glory of the Lord has departed. She named her son that, symbolic that Israel had lost the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, so now the Philistines have this, all right? And they're rejoicing because they got this religious relic. The, uh, Israel, the, the Philistines worshipped a god named Dagon. He was a fish god. I found this picture off of some of the uh, ancient carvings from old Philistine cities that we have found. This is what Dagon looked like. He was a fish god. Uh, they captured the ark. The Philistines tried 
uh, to put it in their national pantheon as kind of a trophy. <laughs> we have conquered this uh, Jehovah God of the Israelites. And what they did is they brought it and they put it, um, well, they wanted to prove that their gods were greater than this Jehovah. So what they did was they brought it to the temple of, of uh, Dagon. Okay? And you see that. Great big statue of the fish god Dagon that they worshipped regularly there. Big stone, carved out of stone was that big, big fish god. So they bring this Ark of the Covenant and they set it in the temple of Dagon. All right? I want you, I want you to imagine this with me, okay? It gets to the end of the day. The priest, the, the Philistine priests had been working in there and people were coming and worshipping Dagon. And it gets to the end of the day. And the priests go home, the temple's locked up, and here is the big stone, Dagon, and over here is the Ark of the Covenant. Well, in the morning, they found the big stone, great big huge stone, had toppled over and fell before the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I want you to imagine this with me. What happened during the night? In the night, dark in that temple, nobody around, nobody saw what happened. Let's use our sanctified imagination. And I want you to think about what might have happened during that night, okay? Here's the great big stone, Dagon, and over here is the Ark of the Covenant. During the middle of the night, the Lord comes and appears between, I'm just making this up, it doesn't tell us that this is what happened, but... Using my sanctified imagination, this could have been what happened. The Lord comes and dwells between the cherubim. And he looks over at that idol, Dagon, and he says, I want you to fall down and worship me. And big proud Dagon over there, he said, no, I'm the God of the Philistines. The Philistines beat those Israelites. They worship me. I'm not going to fall down and worship you. And God over here on the Ark of the Covenant, he says, I want you to fall down and worship me. I'm the creator of all things. You need to worship me. Remember when Jesus was coming into the um, triumphal entry and the Pharisees didn't like it that the people were singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. And, and they says, you tell them to stop. And Jesus says, if they don't sing it, the Stones are going to cry out and worship me. Yeah, so, G so God tells Dagon to worship him. And proud Dagon says, no, I'm not going to. And the Lord kind of looks past Dagon, and he nods his head, and there's a great big angel right behind Dagon. And he goes, plump. And this tone goes, mm, pow, and falls before the Lord. Dagon is kind of a fish god, man, merman with a tail, a fish, and a torso of man. The next morning, they found the statue of Dagon face down in front of the ark. Isn't that a neat story? I love that. I just love that story. Well, in the morning, the priests of Dagon thought, oh, I don't know what happened. Must have been some earthquake or something. So they, they oh, they set him up again, Okay. Went through the day's activity. You got the ark over here. You got the fish god Dagon over here. And it comes the next night. And the Lord appears at the ark of the covenant again. And the Lord says, Dagon, I want you to fall down and worship me. What? You made me do that last night. And the Lord nods his head. And this time, that great big angel that's standing behind Dagon, he got a little more force into it. And he goes, pow, that time. And Dagon goes, Bam! Did you ever you're walking along and you trip and you go face down into the sidewalk? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what Dagon felt like. The only thing was he was stoned and his hands and his head cracked off. So the next night, when the people of Estad rode the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen down, face down on the ground before the ark. So that was verse 3. Here, I, I've intertwined verses in here. When I have actually quoting from Scripture, they are bold and italicized, okay? So that's verse 3. So they set Dagon back up in his place, but the next morning, verse 4, they found him fallen over forward in front of the ark again, this time with his head and his hands broken off. 
whoa, we better not keep this Ark of the Covenant. I don't know what happened. Could it be that Jehovah is stronger than Dagon? The Philistines thought. So they took the Ark of the Covenant out there and it dwelt in a city. Well, another story. So they put it in a city. The Philistines started in that city to get tumors. They had the Ark of the Covenant in the city. The Philistines walked by it every day. And all of a sudden, they started. the Bible says they started getting tumors and die. So they sent it to another. Uh, here, here's the, that verse. The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people in Ashdod. That was the city it was in. And he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. It's kind of interesting. The Hebrew word that's translated here as tumors is kind of hard to translate. Hebrew scholars don't know exactly what it means. Some Bible translations, oddly enough, have translated it as hemorrhoids. Ah, these, I suppose that would be pretty awful. The whole Philistines in the city of Ashdod start getting hemorrhoids. I, I think the better translation is tumors. They were probably outward growths that grew on their body and People were dying from it. So the people of Ashdod, they said, hey, we don't want this Ark of the Covenant here. So they carried it to Gath, another um, Philistine city. But the people there started getting tumors and dying as well. So they brought it to a third city, Ekron, in verse 10. And the same thing happened. So these Philistines had conquered the Ark of the Covenant. Their army was stronger than Israel's army. But you know what? Their God was not stronger than Israel's God. And every city it was in, they started getting tumors and dying from these growths that were coming on them. So, what are they going to do? Well, here's what happened. Still in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 6. So, after seven months of this, so seven months it took, you know, a couple of months, people are dying from tumors, so they move it to another city. Those people get tumors, so they move it to another city. Seven months go by. So they went to their priests and the diviners. These were Philistine priests. They weren't worshiping the true God. They were priests of Dagon and the other Philistine gods that they had. And they said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Our people are dying of these tumors. Is it really from Israel's God? Is it really from the Ark of this Covenant? So the priests came up with an idea. They were desperate to get rid of it. The priest says, why don't you put it on a cart, and we're going to take two um, oxen, two cows, and we're going to send it off to Israel. It's rather interesting. I don't know why they did this, but the scripture says, what verse? Verse 7, they made some golden, they took gold, and they smelted it down and shaped it into the form of rats and the form of these tumors, and they sent it along in the cart, with the Ark of the Covenant. Now, rats and tumors. I don't know, I don't know if those were, uh, I have said here, is kind of a sort of a peace offering. But the more I thought about it, I'm not sure. Was it kind of a, uh, uh, a dig at the Israelites? Here, we're going to send some rats and some tumors along with this Ark of the Covenant. I don't know. We don't know their, their uh, motive in doing that. But the Bible says they sent some golden images of tumors and five golden images of rats uh, along with the ark. Now, here's what the priest said. The priest said, we're going to just send the cows out, pulling this cart. If they go to the Israelite city, maybe Israel's God truly is with this ark. But if they wander off somewhere else, we know that the tumors were just, just a coincidence. huh? So they strapped the cart to two cows and sent it away. Here's what happened. 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 9, the, Philist- the priests of the Philistines told the people, this is a quote from verse 9, watch, if it goes up on the way to its own land, to Beth Shemesh, that was the nearest Israelite town, to Beth Shemesh, then it is the God of Israel who has done us this great harm. But if not, then we know that it was not his hand that struck us. It happened by coincidence, okay? So they let the cows go. What do you think? Where do you think they went? Two cows pulling this ark. They could go anywhere they want. Notice it says, if they go up on the way, heading up to Beth Shemesh was up a mountain. 
Okay? The Philistines had the lower land near the coastline. The Israelites lived up in the mountains. And if I were a cow and I had to pull this cart, I'm not going to climb a hill, you know. <laughs> I'm going to pick the easiest way to go. But as soon as they let him go, they probably slapped him on the hind side and said, yeah, get going, Bessie, let's see where you're going to go. And the two cows, here's the verse, verse 12 says, the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh along one highway, lowing as they went. They turned neither to the right nor to the left. So the cows went straight to Beth Shemesh. Isn't that interesting? Ah, kind of a fun story. I got to think it again using my uh, sanctified imagination. I hope it's a sanctified imagination. I don't want to add to scripture, but it says they were lowing as they went. Now you remember Balaam's donkey. Balaam was... The donkey was trying to save Balaam from getting struck by the death angel, and the, and the donkey would go aside, and Balaam would get mad and beat the stupid donkey, and finally the donkey turned around and talked to, to, to Balaam. You know, well, these cows are lowing. That means they're mooing, all right? I wonder what they were saying, huh? Here's what, here's what my sanctified imagination came up with. I think they were singing a praise song to Israelites' God as they were going along. In fact, Dan, the song that they were singing was that one that we sang earlier from Petra. Petra got it from these two cows, and they transcribed it into English, and we sang that. So, so these two cows, they, I don't know, I don't know what they were mooing about, you know, but uh, they were lowing as they went, and they went straight up to Beth Shemesh. So there they are. They went directly back to an Israelite city, and Israel had the ark back again. Okay. Uh-oh, tragedy in Israel. Still in chapter 6, got another story. So this ark comes into the town, and the people are all excited about, hey, wow, we got the ark back. How come the Philistines sent it back? It's on this cart, and they sent it here, and, and the cattle came straight up here. And so they were all excited about it, but they were very curious. Huh? I wonder if those Philistines have stuck something in there, or I wonder what's going on here. So... Uh, that's how it got back, the, the ark got back, but a tragic, tragic thing happened in Beth Shemesh, according to verse 19. The men of the city opened the ark and looked into it. They thought they were being, maybe, you know, the Philistines got some big warrior hiding in there or something, you know. They opened it and looked into it, but the ark of the covenant was holy. In the law, it said they were not to touch it. They were not to look into it under penalty of death. They were forbidden from doing that. These people were ignorant of, they ignored the law of God. And here's the verse, 19. So the Lord struck 70 men of them dead. And the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people of Beth Shemesh with a great blow. Now when you read that, when I first read that, and a little bit later, we're going we're gonna to do that as well, um, I kind of felt, huh, Lord, why, why would you do such a thing? That sounds, sounds cruel. These men were rejoicing because the ark was back. The Israelites had the ark back, and, and they just wanted to check it out, and all of a sudden, 70 men die. But we need to understand the holiness of the Lord, and we need to understand that the law forbid them from doing what they did. The Lord struck 70 men of that town dead. Well, so the ark stayed there. Okay, Beth Shemesh. How does this relate to Psalm 24? Let's look at verse 20 of 1 Samuel chapter 6, okay? Remember those couple of quotes we looked at from 1st uh, or from Psalm 24. This is what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 6. Then the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? Hey, you know, that sounds kind of familiar. 
David, in writing Psalm 24, said the same thing. Who is able to stand before the Lord? I think that's kind of why that, that phrase stayed with the ark for a hundred years. David knew that phrase and included it in Psalm 24 that we're going to look at in more detail next week. So that's why many of the Bible scholars believe Psalm 24 was written on the occasion of the ark. Okay? Okay, that's the very same quote the psalmist raised in our text. Psalm 24, verse 3 says, Who can stand before God? All right, people were getting the idea that the ark was a dangerous thing to have around, huh? The Philistines got tumors from it. Seventy men died from looking into it. It was a very holy article that they were treating with, with contempt. All right, the house of Abinadab, 1 Samuel chapter 7 yet, still in 1 Samuel. Uh, 1 Samuel verse 7 verses 1 and 2 say this, and the men of Kiriath Jerim came and took up the ark of the Lord. Seventy men had died. So these men come now, get the ark of the Lord, and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. They consecrated his son, Eleazar, to have charge of the ark of the Lord from the day that the ark was lodged at kirith Jerim. Okay, so that's where it stayed. Okay? The text talks about it staying there for 20 years, but it actually stayed there for, as you go on in history, it stayed there. Probably, what was his son's name? What was his son's name? Eliezer took care of the ark. He made sure he didn't touch it. <laughs> he made sure he didn't look inside of it because he knew what that cost those 70 men. But he took care of the ark. Probably his kids took over after that. And we now jump a whole century ahead. This was 1 Samuel chapter 7. Near the end of the period of Judges, okay, now we jump a century ahead, a hundred years later. We're going to jump up to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6, a hundred years later. The Ark of the Covenant had stayed there for a hundred years. We know that from the text. It's a different name, but Bible scholars tell us it's the same place. Here it is. We hear almost nothing about the ark until, again, until 2 Samuel 6. We come to the time of David. So the judges had ended. They had Saul as their king. Saul was a very bad king. David fled from him for seven and a half years. Finally, David became king. Um, and David is getting a little older. He knows he's getting, what he's doing is he's getting things ready for his son to build the temple. The Lord said, nope, David, you're not going to build the temple because you're a man of blood. But David wanted to get everything ready for Solomon to build the temple. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 says this, David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah, Baale Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God. Bible scholars tell us that this Baal Judah is the same place as that Beth, Beth Shemesh, Beth Shemesh where it, was, where it stayed in the book of Judges, a hundred years, and all of these people are going to bring it up from there, the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord, Jehovah of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. That's what the text says. He was symbolically considered to dwell between the cherubim. Isn't that interesting? Because that is exactly symbolic of our salvation when Jesus Christ's blood was covered the law that we could be forgiven of our sins. They believed God uh, symbolically. They knew he didn't actually dwell there. Solomon in his prayer, Solomon got the temple built and we have um, a recorded prayer from Solomon. And Solomon starts off by saying, we know that you cannot dwell in a house made by man. So they knew God was bigger than that. But there was this kind of a symbolic place between the cherubim that the Lord's presence was there in a very special way. Okay, so David has in his heart, was this a good desire? 
David wanted to bring the ark down to Jerusalem. The temple would get built. The ark would be put in the Holy of Holies in this new temple that his son was going to build. This was a good desire that David had. David went to bring the ark up to Jerusalem. David went to bring the ark up to Jerusalem because it was there on, uh, on the Holy Mount where David's son Solomon would build the permanent temple to worship. Okay? It was a symbolic dwelling place of the Lord. That's where the ark rightfully belonged. All right. So David goes down there, 30,000 people. And the Philistines had sent this thing back on a cart. David puts the ark on a cart in verse 3. Now that was a problem. If you didn't know the law and you hadn't been versed in the law, you'd have thought, well, how are we going to get this thing from over here, Beth Shemesh, over to Jerusalem? Well, let's put it on an, a, a cart and have some guys walk alongside it so it don't tip over. So that's what they did. But that was a serious mistake. The law of Moses gives clear instructions on how the Ark of the Covenant was to be transported. It had rings on the side, and in the building of the tabernacle, there were some long golden poles, and they were to rest on the shoulders of a certain sub-tribe of the priests. It was to be carried by the... Co co help me out here. Kohathites. Co <laughs> co there we go. Kohathites, which was a, a, a division of the tribe of the priests, and they were supposed to transport the ark. Uh, no one else was to carry the ark. And furthermore, even the Kohites were not, Koha, Kohathites were not permitted to touch the ark according to Numbers 4.15. They were to slide the poles in there and then carry it on the poles. Very stable way of transporting it. And it did not have to be touched that way. Okay. Well, here they are, walking along, David with his 30,000 men. They're all rejoicing. It was a big celebration. Yay, we're bringing the ark back to Jerusalem. Yeehaw, woo! -hoo! And tragedy strikes. Verses 6 and 7. Look at this. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah, now we don't know much about Uzzah, but Uzzah was walking along with the Ark of the Covenant, which was being transported on this ark, or on this cart. Um, seems to be a very faithful guy. Seems to be a guy who cared about the Ark, cared about this mission of David. Um, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the Ark of God because the oxen had stumbled. So they're going down a very rough road, and one of the oxen stumbles, and then the cart starts toppling a little bit. And Uzzah, out of concern for the Ark of the Covenant, he reaches out, well, let's stabilize this thing. We don't want it falling over. We don't know for sure, but it sure seems like he had good, honest, sincere motives, doesn't it? Um, the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there beside the Ark of God. I remember as a young Christian, when I first read that, I, I was mad when I first read that. I says, what? God, how, can, what? how come you did that? This guy was helping. <clears throat> what if that ark had toppled over and broke? And, you know, this guy was stabilizing the ark. All of a sudden, you reach down and you strike him dead. Well, the ark, it said clearly in the law, the ark was not supposed to be touched. David was not transporting it the way that the law had said. Now, David seems to have good motives in this. Uzzah seems to have good motives in this. But they broke God's law. You know what? We do that every day. I'm so thankful for forgiveness from the Lord, you know. I'm so thankful that Jesus' blood was shed on the mercy seat that we can confess our sins because God will be faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Huh? The Lord's anger burned against us because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Well, David's response. 
That instantly brought a halt to the celebrating. Yeah, can you imagine? They're all happy and celebrating. The ark's coming down, and Uzzah reaches out, and Uzzah dies. Whoa, that put a cloud over the whole celebration, didn't it? David's response, first was anger, and then fear. And that's probably what our response would have been. First of all, God, why did you do that? And then, whoa. Then David was angry because of the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day the place is called Perez Uzzah, the breaking out. David was afraid of God, the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me, come to Jerusalem so that we can build a temple? How, how are we going to accomplish this? Well, he was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom uh, the Giddite. Okay, so they found a place close by. They brought it to this guy's house and left it there. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to get it up. Huh? Probably not yet at this time did David realize that he had carried the ark improperly. But later he did find out the ark at Obed-Edom's home. And that's where the ark remained for three more months. During that three months, David probably consulted with the priest, and the priest said, Ah, David, you... Uh, you carried that wrong, the, the ark the wrong way. And so David found out that it, he was to blame. It was his fault. And um, now, no, no imagine, now imagine if you were Obed-Edom, the Giddite. <laughs> Obed-Edom, we're going to bring this. It's just, this ark just killed somebody, but we're going to park it here in your house for a while until we can figure out what to do. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I don't know if I want that here. Well... You'd probably be a little nervous about having the ark in your house, not the sort of coffee table or conversation piece you'd be comfortable with in your living room. Uh, don't touch that. This is the ark of the covenant. <laughs> <laughs> they left it here, but don't touch it. <laughs> You'll die right in my living room. I don't have to call, you know, the ambulance and have you carried out. So just, but there it is. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Well, God blessed the home of Obed Edom. It turned out to be a great blessing for him. Verse 11 says, The Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his household. Now, we don't know how. It doesn't say any more than that. That's all it says, you know. Uh, I've said here, Scripture doesn't say how God blessed Obed-Edom and his household, but it was in some obvious, remarkable way because this, the Scripture says that his household was was blessed. Um, I says, no doubt whatever he did was prosperous in such an extraordinary way that it was obvious to everyone that the Lord, that God's favor rested on him. He was being faithful to take care of this ark, and the Lord blessed him for doing that. So much so that everyone said, whoa, look at the Lord is blessing him. All right, our final story. Let me wander over and kind of look down at the clock. Oh yeah, we're about there. All right, our final story. Now David brings the ark. So when he, it was reported to David, verse 12, David's fear uh, about bringing the ark to Jerusalem was swept away, and he finally, here's the quote, went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. Okay? Uh, so David again set out to bring the ark of the covenant to Jerusalem, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 through 15. Here's the text, all right? It says here, So David went up and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. That's important. And when those who bore the ark, ah, those who bore the ark, those who bore the ark, oh, David's doing it the right way this time, huh? And those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps they sacrificed an oxen and a fatted animal. So every six steps, they sacrificed an oxen. That took quite a one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, sacrifice another one. One, two. So they sacrificed an oxen every six steps on the way. And just notice this. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. Can you imagine what David looked like? David was dressed down and just had an ephod on. In fact, in fact, his, one of his wives, Saul's daughter, Michael, 
saw David dancing before the Lord when they came into Jerusalem, and she tried to rebuke David. That's a whole other story that we won't get into here. But David danced before the Lord with all of his might, and David was wearing an ephod, it says. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet, the horn, the ram's horn, the shofar. The Hebrew word that's used there is the shofar. Okay, so the background, there we are. I know, it took a whole long time. But interesting stories, huh? You can imagine what is going through David's mind. He knew all of this as he brings the Ark of the Covenant to the gates of the Jerusalem, this processional coming from the house of Obed-Edom and carrying it this time, carrying it up to, and Israel was kind of on a hill, so they're coming up to the, to the eastern gate of Jerusalem to come in, and that's where, whether he wrote it the night before, perhaps, Bible scholars believe Psalm 24 fits into the history of Israel. Most com Bible commentators believe that Psalm 24 was written at this point in Israel's history, when the Psalm speaks of the gates to open for the King of Glory. We looked at that phrase early in our message, it refers to when David brought the ark to the gates of Jerusalem. You can just see the, the priests carrying the ark on the poles and they come up to the gate of Jerusalem and they're all singing Psalm 24 and the gatekeepers all of a sudden open the gate and the ark of the Lord and this procession comes marching into Jerusalem with great rejoicing. When David in the Psalm speaks of who can stand before the Lord, he refers to the tragic history of of this ark where people died because they disobeyed the law of the Lord. Okay, application. Ah, kind of interesting stories. Yeah, we've gone on and on and I've carried about, how many stories? I got my list. Eight, nine stories there that we've, we've looked at about the history of the Ark of the Covenant. All right, what can we take from this? Okay, God is holy and will punish sin. The Bible tells us he cannot let sin go unpunished. That is why Jesus had to die. God had to redeem mankind, and his son, Jesus Christ, spilled his blood on the mercy seat so that we could have salvation, because God needs to punish sin. It gives us all those deaths associated with the ark, gives us some insight into why Jesus went to the cross. It was the holiness of God. Second, means of application. God is to be obeyed and obeyed in detail. I have said this, partial obedience is disobedience. David thought he was doing a great thing, let's bring this ark up, let's put it on this cart and bring it up, and Uzzah dies from that because David disobeyed the law of the Lord. We need to obey the law of the Lord. Number three, God will bless those who obey and serve him. Uh, the house of Obed-Edom was blessed because he was faithfully taking care. The scary thing was brought into his house. He obviously took it in, and he watched over it and took care of it, and the Lord blessed his household because of his faithfulness. And lastly, today, God does not dwell in an object like at the ark. He dwells in the hearts and in the lives of the believers. The Bible says that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we become born again, and we become indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. God indwells you today if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. I hope that all of you today have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Jesus' blood was spilt on the cross, pictured in that blood being sprinkled on the mercy seat. And those who will accept Jesus Christ as their Savior can have God dwelling in them, changing and transforming your life. Do you know him today? Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will help us to realize your holiness and the seriousness of sin. Father, we often take sin so lightly. We think that it is really not important that we try to live a faithful, holy life. 
But Father, help us to, to, to realize the seriousness. Help us to realize that you are with us each day and that you will help us and guide us in our lives, Father. I pray that you will bless next week as we look at the text of this psalm, Psalm 24, and may we learn from it, Father. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.